Okay, try that again. Welcome to the 2021 UC Davis Tahoe Environmental Research Center docent training. We are super excited to have you all here. We are going to start out with a presentation by Dave Antonucci. Dave has been in the Tahoe Basin for decades and he has a uh, wealth of knowledge. His presentation has been well honed and is a fantastic introduction. We call it Tahoe 101. He calls it Lake of the Sky. I'm gonna go ahead and spotlight Dave for everyone. But before we do that, I have a, a poll I would like to launch for everyone. So if everyone could just rate your Tahoe knowledge, we're gonna ask you the same question after the fact. So none, uh, little, some, or a lot. And um, you can just answer that question real quick. It's all anonymous. So uh, no worries with your answer. And we've got five of 20. Looks like we have a good mix of uh, knowledge. And uh, you'll, some of those jokes are Allison's jokes um, as far as the uh, <laughs> Smarter than the average bear <laughs> or Dr. Tahoe PhD. All right, we almost have everybody. Two more people still need to vote. And we'll give it five more seconds here. So it looks like we have 6% uh, none, 22% a little, 11% or sorry, 61% some and 11% a lot. And so I will share those results so you can see um, where everybody's at. So most people say they know some information and I will stop that and I am going to um, go ahead and spotlight Dave for us and we'll let Dave take it over. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Heather. Uh, let's see here. I want to share my screen. I hope everybody can see that okay. Uh, well, thanks again, Heather, and welcome everybody. Uh, this is about Lake, the, Lake of the Sky, which is another term that we use to describe Lake Tahoe, which is some people think it's because the, the lake is so high, it's in the sky. Others say it's called Lake of the Sky because it reflects the, uh, the blueness of the sky, but you'll find out later um, about that aspect. I always like to start off by uh, referring to Mark Twain, who everybody knows. He came up here in 1861 on the North Shore near Tahoe Vista to stake a claim. And then 10 years later, he wrote a book called Roughing It. Uh, and there's two chapters devoted to his experiences at Lake Tahoe. And you, you probably have seen his quotes plastered all over everything. All, there's hardly a science report that doesn't start with a preamble about Mark Twain and the fairest picture the whole earth affords. But he described the clarity of the water as not merely transparent, but dazzlingly, brilliantly slow. All objects seen through it had a bright, strong vividness, not only of outline, but of every minute detail. He then traveled the uh, world giving lectures and Lake Tahoe was always the, the lake he compared other lakes to, it was his gold standard. And of course, no other lake in the world that he traveled to ever mentioned, uh, measured up. He once mused that towards the end of his life, he would come back to Lake Tahoe to die. But then he said, but then again, I probably will make a failure of it because the place is so darn beautiful. I'll just keep on go living. So uh, I hope you've gained the same kind of vitality and renewed spirit and sense of peace that Mark Twain got when he came to Lake Tahoe and hopefully you'll have that um, after I'm done today. First thing we'll talk about is how Lake Tahoe got here and the geologic formation of the lake. It um, is a combination of geologic processes uh, that involved, first of all, volcanoes uh, along the north and northwest shore of Lake Tahoe uh, that raised the land level and then uh, following that, faulting occurred. And we've had some experiences with that lately with some of the recent earthquakes that have occurred on, I think it's this fault right here, the state line fault. 
Um, they've been measured right here. They're referenced from Dollar Point, but it's not on the Dollar Point fault or the West Tahoe fault. Uh, but these faults uh, were created by the collision of plates on the earth. Uh, briefly, the earth, uh, the continents and the ocean plates are adrift and they collide with each other and move around. And what's happening is the, the bottom of the Pacific Ocean is sliding under the North American plate and it's causing all kinds of havoc underneath us, creating these, these kind of faults. If we were to take a, a side view look at Lake Tahoe, uh, say beginning 6 million years ago, you would see the volcanoes uh, arising and, and forming and uh, raising the, the terrain along the North Shore, like Martis Peak, uh, Mount Pluto. Those are some of the volcanoes um, that are involved in this. And then beginning uh, about three and a half to three million years ago, there was faulting that occurred, which are faults are just cracks in the Earth's crust. And then um, what began was the lake bottom began to fall as the mountains on either side began to rise and the basin that was created by the falling lake bottom filled with water. And that's how we got Lake Tahoe. This process is still happening. The lake bottom is still, all the faults are still active and uh, the mountains on either side are, are still active. Here. Okay. So now we've got Lake Tahoe here on the face of the earth. I'm going to quickly go through the cultural environmental history. One thing you have to understand is the interaction between humans and the Lake Tahoe environment has shaped where we are today and different things that happened in human history then have been reflected in how Lake Tahoe uh, evolved. Uh, the original inhabitants of Lake Tahoe were, of course, the Washoe tribe and their ancestors. The, the tribe has only been traced back to about 1400 or 1500 years, but their ancestors date back as far as eight to 10,000 years. This is a, a map that shows their approximate territory in the center of which was Lake Tahoe. They came up in the uh, summertime and camped around the lake. They uh, took fish from the lake. The Lahan cutthroat was a central part of their diet. They also believed that the lake had its own spiritual values and that it was capable of imparting uh, spiritual benefit to each of the tribal members, which is one of the reasons why they came to Tahoe in the summer was more or less to pay their respects. If you will, Tahoe was their church. And um, it not only nourished their bodies with food, but it also nourished their spirits. Um, of course, we know what happened. They were driven out uh, in the middle of the 19th century, although some families continued to come up uh, into the early 20th century and still camp around Lake Tahoe uh, where land was available. We do get the name Tahoe from the Washoe language, their term, their phrase for Lake Tahoe was Da'au'aga, Da'au'aga, which loosely translated means edge of the lake. And of course, Anglo-Americans heard the first two syllables, Da'au, and that kind of got turned into Tahoe, which did rhyme with Washoe. And that's how uh, Tahoe got its name. It was called uh, Lake Bigler prior to that, and I won't get into the details of it other than to say that uh, Bigler, who was a governor of California, uh, was a, a Confederate. And so the feds took his name off the lake and replaced it with what they thought was a Native American name, which was Tahoe. So Tahoe laid uh, pretty well undisturbed for a long time. Uh, there were pioneers passing through, but they were on their way to the gold fields and that. But what really changed Tahoe was the discovery of gold and silver on the Comstock load in 1859. This generated a demand for lumber and wood products. And so beginning in about 1870, there was a 30 year period where the forests of Tahoe were heavily logged. 90 or 95% of the trees were cut 
and sawed into uh, timber uh, and, and dimension lumber and then shipped to the mine, either the mines in Virginia City or the uh, Transcontinental Railroad. It was, some describe it almost as a clear cut as you can see in some of these pictures, although some trees did remain, but most of the trees that you see at Lake Tahoe are now less than 135 years old. Uh, while we are shocked and horrified at the amount of timber cutting that occurred based on our current uh, environmental standards and, and beliefs in that, uh, we have to give it to them on how they were innovative in getting the lumber to the market. This is an outline of the, of the forests that were accessible to the, the law the sawmills and the loggers, this is what they took. And virtually all of it, very little was left, but you have to give it to them on how innovative they were in getting the, the logs sawed and off to market. Here you can see large tree uh, logs being hauled by rail or by oxen teams. They were taken down to the lakeshore where the logs were then gathered into booms that you see here and then towed across the lake by steamer to one of two main sawmill sites. The main one was at Glenbrook and then there was another sawmill site uh, near Incline Village um, where the old Ponderosa uh, amusement park used to be. And then from there, uh, the logs were pulled out of the water and into the sawmills. This is uh, a picture taken of Glenbrook in the 1870s. And, and what you see right here, this is not shoreline, this is sawdust and log waste that was dumped back into the lake. So this is how they handled their waste disposal. And it uh, was one way that Lake Tahoe was changed. Once the, uh, the logs were sawed into lumber, they were put on a, either a, some kind of train or a, a tram and taken up to a flume. And here, here in the case of the Glenbrook uh, sawmill complex, you can see the, the sawed timbers sitting on a rail car waiting to be uh, discharged into a flume. They were taken in the case of uh, Glenbrook up to Spooner Summit where it was loaded into a waterborne flume. And then it uh, went all the way down uh, Clear Creek down to Carson City and it ended about where the railroad museum is now. There was a lumber yard there. And then from there, uh, there was another uh, railroad that took, this was the Virginia and Truckee that took the, the, lump, the finished lumber off to Virginia City or later off to the Continental, Intercontinental Railway uh, at, at Reno where it was used to construct the railway and to construct towns. Um, along the railway. This is Virginia City in the 1880s. Most of what you see there was built with Tahoe lumber. Virginia City burned several times and every time they had to get more lumber from, from Tahoe to rebuild. Um, the lumber was used of course for mine shoring but also for structural lumber for buildings and also for fuel wood to generate uh, power to heat water to create steam to uh, run the, the, uh, the mills for uh, processing of the, of the silver ore. Now, along with this, uh, originally the Lake Tahoe had a dam on it. It was used to float logs down the Truckee River. Uh, that dam was replaced in the early 1900s uh, by the Truckee River General Electric Company. They were gonna hold water at Lake Tahoe and then use it to release water to generate power downstream um, on the Truckee River. Those power stations you see uh, on your way to Reno on Highway 80 were part of this project. But in 1913, uh, the US Bureau of Reclamation had a better idea and that was they wanted to use the water of Lake Tahoe to irrigate Western Nevada to grow food for the area. Of course, it, Western Nevada was dry and arid and didn't have a lot of water. And so there was a desire to um, bring water to this area. They took over the Tahoe Dam before it was finished construction, and that's the dam you see today. So that's the second dam. And then 
water is released for various reasons. Uh, the water that's stored in Lake Tahoe is the upper 6.1 feet, uh, which we're getting down now <laughs> to the last less than two feet, as you've probably heard. And uh, we're less than 6225 and 6223 is the rim that you see at the bottom there. That water uh, is owned by uh, multiple parties. The Pyramid Lake tribe has rights to that water. The farmers in Fallon have rights to the water. The cities of Reno and Sparks have rights to that water. And some of the farmers that are still remaining uh, in the Truckee Meadows have rights to that water. So it, it's always been a huge controversy about splitting up the water. Uh, one water rights lawyer once told me that the federal government made the mistake of giving away the same water to Lake Tahoe over and over again. And that's why there's been such a, a conflict over it. But even as the logging was occurring and the forest was beginning to recover, people were coming to Lake Tahoe for pleasure and uh, for medical purposes, actually. There was a belief that because they are Lake Tahoe was clean and pure, it would ail, cure whatever was ailing you. At the time, this was before the germ theory of disease and people thought disease was caused by bad air. So if you got away from bad air in the cities or wherever and came up to a place like Lake Tahoe, whatever ailment you had would go away because you were now breathing beer air and drinking pure clean water. So these are some of the resorts that sprang up around around the lake where people would uh, stay. Now, how did you get to Lake Tahoe in the early 20th century? This is before cars, not long before cars, but before cars. And what you did, let's say you were a business person uh, in San Francisco, you would take the Southern Pacific Main Line to Truckee where you would get off in Truckee and then you would take a narrow gauge railway all the way to Tahoe City. And there, you would either get off the train and you would stay at the Tahoe Tavern, which is right there in Tahoe City at the end of the rail line, or you would walk across the pier where the train is pulled out on the pier and you'd get on the steamer Tahoe. And then the steamer Tahoe would take you to wherever you were staying around the lake. And it would circumnavigate the lake in about eight hours, covering about 72 miles along the way before returning to Tahoe City. So people would get off or get back on. The, uh, the steamer would carry freight, mail, and things like that. And it operated into the late 30s, early 40s. Uh, but the advent of the automobile really changed things. Um, and eventually the train uh, was abandoned and the steamer was scuttled and sunk in the waters. Well, when you were at Lake Tahoe, what did you do in the early 20th century? Uh, one of the things you did uh, is you might go out on the lake on a, on a rowboat and in the evening you might uh, dance uh, and socialize. One thing, it was uh, very important. If you were from San Francisco, it was as important to be seen at Lake Tahoe as to be at Lake Tahoe for yourself because it was a sign of your um, your status in life and your wealth to be able to travel to Lake Tahoe and to spend time here during the summer uh, to enjoy the lake. Here you can see people out on the veranda of the Tahoe Tavern, which was in Tahoe City. Some brave people would wade into the water, uh, but they would never go swimming because everybody in that picture believed that it was impossible to float in Lake Tahoe. They didn't believe that because the lake was so high that the water was not as dense as sea level and that you would sink. And this wasn't disproven until 1915 uh, when somebody jumped off a rowboat with a rope tied around their waist and proved you could swim in Lake Tahoe. So this pretty much was the way Tahoe was until the post-war. Uh, of course, Tahoe laid uh, pretty much undisturbed other than the, the luxury resorts during the depression and World War II. But then following World War II, things started to change. Cars uh, were now prevalent. Uh, you had returning GIs with families and a new type of resort sprung up that now catered to the drive up clientele. No longer did you have to take the train or the steamboat. You could drive on 
roads, paved roads around Lake Tahoe to get to where you were staying. What followed then is what's called a, a second gold rush in Lake Tahoe and actually in the Sierra. Uh, beginning in the 60s, land in the Sierra Nevada became very desirable because people had leisure time, they had discretion, uh, discretion, money for discretional spending, they had families, and they had all-weather highways that could get them up to Lake Tahoe so the, and other places in the Sierra. So there was a great movement to now develop the Sierra for tourism, second homes, and things like that, and Lake Tahoe was part of that. So because Lake Tahoe is Lake Tahoe, it was highly desirable because of the lake. And so it saw development particularly intensively and in ways uh, that other areas did not see. This is the uh, marsh, uh, the outlet of the upper Truckee River in South Lake Tahoe. And of course we know what happened there. This is Tahoe Keys uh, that was created um, beginning in the late 50s and through the mid 60s uh, to create waterfront property by dredging out the marsh. These are the types of things that were going on. Um, you've probably all seen this development uh, off of Highway 28 in Nevada, where you've got high-rise casino, uh, high-rise uh, condominiums, and then condos located very close to the shoreline, uh, ruining the the view from the highway. And that this has created a great deal of concern. Uh, about what was happening at Lake Tahoe. Uh, environmentalists became very active. Uh, there were several attempts informally to try to resolve differences, but those didn't go anywhere. And so beginning in 1968 and culminating in 1969, the two states, California and Nevada, got together and did negotiated an interstate compact that would basically lay out a plan for how Lake Tahoe would develop. I'm gonna pop in for a quick second and I wanna yep. just make sure everybody's paying attention and launch a quick poll about what you were just talking about and then I'm gonna do a pre-quiz. So um, this poll has two questions to it. It is a question, what geological process formed Lake Tahoe? Earthquakes, glaciers, volcanoes, water erosion, or all of the above? You can answer that one. The second question is the period from 1870 to 1900 when 95% uh, of Tahoe forests were clear cut was called what? The Great Silver Discovery, the Exploitation of Tahoe, the Comstock Lobe, the Western Settlement. And so if you wanna just pop your answer in real quick, it's all anonymous, so um, no worries. Whatever your first guess is. And don't worry if you clicked on something faster than you wanted to and can't undo it, that's fine too. And uh, we'll just give that less than one minute here. We got uh, 10 more seconds and I'm gonna end the polling. We've got most people have voted now. And we'll wait for the last vote. Okay, everybody did it, great. Okay. So um, it looks like 63% of you uh, knew that it was all of the above. So yes, indeed. Uh, earthquakes and faulting. Glaciers also shaped the west shore. Uh, volcanoes on the north shore. Water erosion also shaped the Truckee River corridor and all of our different creek corridors. So all of the above is the correct answer. Um, the next question was the period of clear cutting is called the Comstock load. That was the silver that was found in Nevada. That is the reason that they did all of that clear cutting was to shore up those mines. And um, so I'm gonna stop sharing that result and I'm gonna do one pre-quiz before Dave continues on. Um, and did I share that with you all or did I just read that to you? Um, okay, I'm gonna stop sharing that if you all got to see that. And then I'm gonna do the next quiz, which is, okay, so two questions. Uh, question one, according to growth projections, what would be the peak population if all of Tahoe lands were fully developed? You could take a guess. And because of Tahoe's shared uh, sharing between the two states, the two states reached this bi-state agreement on land use and environmental protection resulting in the formation of what organization? So here you go. 
We'll give you like 30 seconds. You can go ahead and give your best guesses. And I feel like I need that Jeopardy uh, music. <laughs> Alex Trebek. Yeah. I should have that on my phone available. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, we're almost all voted already. So great job. And I'll end polling in five seconds here. Oh, we're almost done. You guys are good. You guys are fast. All right, I'm going to end polling now and share the results. So it looks like we're about equally split um, in the difference between that. So I think Dave's about to tell you that answer. And 73% of us knew that that by state uh, agreement was the Tahoe, formed the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency. It had a different name to start. And I will uh, let Dave continue. Sorry about the interruption, Dave. That's all right. So uh, we have a, a draft compact from the approved by the two states. It, it turned out to be highly flawed uh, because it was a product of compromise. Nonetheless, it went to Congress as required under the Constitution, where two or more states can enter into compacts or agreements among themselves, but they have to be ratified by Congress, which this was ratified by Congress and then signed into law by the President of the United States in 1968. And this created the Tahoe Regional Planning Compact. The Tahoe Regional Planning Compact then created a bi-state agency called the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency that was given authority over all aspects of human activity at Lake Tahoe and proceeded to try to control the growth of which they were not very successful. Uh, if all of the private land had been built out to the current county zoning, what was allowed by local governments, we would have a peak population today of over 600,000 right now. And um, right now our population is actually quite a bit less than that because this is what the actual came out and it's the result of TRPA. One of the things TRPA did is they did something called down zoning of private land. So somebody that maybe owned 50 acres and thought they could put uh, four houses per acre on their land to get 200 homes on 50 acres, had their land down zoned to general forest, which allowed them to put one house on 50 acres. And that's how they got to this low population. Even the developers agreed and didn't object that much to uh, how much growth would be curtailed by uh, TRPA. And you can see how much uh, less growth occurred in the basin. It still was subject to quite a bit of uh, litigation over the years in which uh, people claimed uh, their rights were being, private property rights were being taken away. This was all litigated. And most of the court decisions, if not all, were found in favor of TRPA. And uh, they were able to carry out their mandate. In 1980, the whole compact was revised again and made much more strict. And the flaws from the original compact were eliminated. And for the first time, TRPA got a grip on the growth and the growth rate at Lake Tahoe. But there was a period there of about 20 or 30 years where Lake Tahoe just got pounded with growth year after year after year after year. So before you go into frequently asked questions, I have a Tahoe trivia game for everyone. So I'm gonna launch the poll. Mm -hmm. And um, so there are six questions in here and uh, you might wanna read all the answers before you choose your answer. But um, the first question is how big is Lake Tahoe? The uh, second question is how deep is the deepest point? And again, this is all anonymous, just give it your best guess and I will wait to share results until Dave has given you all the answers. Um, the third question, if we were to drain Lake Tahoe, how many years would it take to refill? Um, so you can go ahead and answer those questions. There are six questions there. Question four, 
According to the annual Tahoe water budget, where does the water exiting Tahoe go over the course of one year? Um, and then can everyone see that poll? Can you see it? I'm not getting any answers happening yet. Where you guys were so fast last time. Oh, you want us to answer? Yeah, go for it. Yep, go ahead and answer. So you go ahead and answer now and then um, give it your best guess. So four, the Lake Tahoe water budget. Five is why doesn't Tahoe freeze? Six is who was the great American writer who hiked from Carson City to Lake Tahoe in 1861? And um, you can keep going. I've only got two of 27 people have voted so far. So there we go. Now everybody's doing it. There's a lot of questions. I know at six, you got to scroll through them. And then we'll let Dave, this is our Tahoe trivia. The fun part is you got to put some skin in the game here to give your, give your answer mm -hmm. to start. All right, now everybody's doing it. There we go. There was quite a bit of reading in this one, I think. Yeah. Okay, half had voted so far. And then we'll wait till Dave gives his answers before um, I share the results and we'll see how everybody did in comparison to the correct answers. So we've got 66% have voted so far. I'm gonna give you 15 more seconds. Okay. Oh, we almost have everybody. Five more seconds. Get your answer in. So just a couple more people. Does anybody need more time or can I end the polling? Oh, there we go. We got everybody. Okay, go for it, Dave. Okay. Common question, how big is Lake Tahoe? 191 square miles. In term, when we say big, we're talking about surface area. So it's 191 square miles. The lake is about one third of the total watershed. The other two thirds, of course, is the terrestrial watershed. The maximum diagonal, or what's referred to as the length of the lake is 21.8 miles. That's measured from about Camp Richardson to just uh, west of Burnt Cedar Beach in uh, Incline Village and measuring from Timberland across the lake to Glenbrook, it's 11.9 miles. The shoreline is 75.1. Yes, you heard that right, 75.1. If you go on the internet and you Google Lake Tahoe shoreline length, you're gonna get tens of thousands of answers that say it's 72 miles. It's by far the biggest myth about Lake Tahoe, uh, wrong piece of data. It got started a long time ago because the, as I mentioned, the, the steamer that went around Lake Tahoe listed their trip at 72 miles. And people thought that was the length of the shoreline that the steamer followed the shoreline. Or they looked at the length of the road around Lake Tahoe, which is about 72 miles and said, that must be the length of Lake Tahoe. They were too lazy to measure it. It's actually 75 miles. And this gets carried through today. Even TRPA makes this mistake sometimes. And uh, I always get a little chuckle about the divers that are cleaning up the lake bottom. They said, you know, their, their uh, motto is cleaning up 72 miles of shoreline. And I say to myself, well, who's doing the other three? <laughs> and that's not to take away from what they're doing, but it just shows you how deeply embedded uh, misinformation about Lake Tahoe occurs and how hard it is to get rid of it. Once it gets into the internet, people believe that uh, if it's on the internet, that's, that's true and that's fact. Well, if we were to take uh, a sideways view of Lake Tahoe, this is what you'd see is about an average of a thousand feet or so, average depth. The maximum depth is 1,645 feet and that's just off of state line point in California. It's the deepest spot. It would be uh, 
right about here, if you can see my cursor where my cursor is pointing. And then you could actually drop the Empire State Building into Lake Tahoe at the deepest point and still have more than enough water to float an aircraft carrier over 175 feet of water. Consider uh, that Carson City, Nevada is still 85 feet higher than the bottom of Lake Tahoe at its deepest part. So when next time you're in Carson City, take a look to the west and consider that the bottom of Lake Tahoe is still almost 100 feet lower than where you're standing. This is how Tahoe uh, compares. Um, on my screen, the, the zoom screens are kind of blocking Lake Tahoe, but it, uh, it, it's a comparison of how Tahoe compare, compares to other lakes in the world. The deepest lake in the world is Lake Baikal. It's over a mile deep. It's also the largest freshwater lake in the world. And then it, it grades down from there. Um, I'm including Crater Lake in this group right now, although Crater Lake is not considered a large lake. Uh, normally when we're doing comparisons of Lake Tahoe, we compare Tahoe to other large lakes. Crater Lake, yes, it's deeper, but it's quite a bit smaller than Lake Tahoe. Depending on whose data you look at, uh, Lake Tahoe is either the 15th or 16th deepest lake in the world. It used to be the 11th, but as we've gotten more data, uh, it looks like some lakes have been measured to be deeper than Tahoe. The thing about Tahoe is of all these lakes, most of them are not this deep and this high together. That's what makes Tahoe so unusual. Another question we get is how pure is Lake Tahoe? And Chamber of Commerce will tell you it's 99.9% .9 pure. And if you do the numbers, you'll know that's not very good. Uh, but Lake Tahoe is 99.992% pure. That works out to about 80 parts per million. And if you were to take a swimming pool like this and dry, dry up all the water and scrape up the residue in the bottom, if this was pool was filled with Lake Tahoe water, you'd have less than a teaspoon of matter, dried substance at the bottom there, mostly bicarbonates and uh, sodium, calcium, magnesium, and those kinds of things. Uh, carbonate uh, are the main constituents of, of Lake Tahoe water. It's very pure water, uh, probably some of the purest lake water on the face of the earth. And just for reference, distilled water that you'd buy at Raley's is 99.999% pure water. So Tahoe's 99.992, distilled water is 99.999% pure water. Another question we get is, why is Lake Tahoe so blue and green? And uh, as I mentioned earlier about why people call Tahoe Lake of the Sky, because they say the blue color is a reflection of the sky. And while the sky can sometimes be reflected in the surface of the lake, the real reason that Lake Tahoe is so blue is the way light behaves when it penetrates the very clear water of Lake Tahoe. Here you can see sunlight, full spectrum sunlight, as it penetrates Lake Tahoe. And what happens is most of the colors are absorbed by water molecules. So by 75 feet, all you're left with is blue and indigo light, indigo colored light. So once you get past 75 feet, Tahoe tends to look blue. And in the near shore, um, it looks green because when it's, um, let me get this back up again, yeah. The green here uh, is the predominant light, if you see like in, in South Lake Tahoe where it's shallow, it, the blue hasn't fully developed yet, meaning the blue is still there, but it hasn't been backscattered toward our eyes. What we're seeing is green and as it turns out is our eyes are most sensitive to the color green. So we tend to see the green water uh, and then as the green begins to fade out and the blue comes in, it, it goes to what's called cyan, which is half green, half blue, and it's kind of a turquoise color. And then that fades out and we get the blue. If you've been out into the middle of the lake, you see this cobalt blue color, which is mainly the indigo 
color and then uh, with blue added to it, more indigo and less blue. I mentioned that uh, Lake Tahoe is one of the highest large lakes in the world, but how does it compare? Well, it's actually the second highest large lake in the world, and it has great depth compared to other large lakes. And that's what set one of the things that sets it apart. Lake Titicaca on, in, on the Bolivia-Chile border uh, is the highest large lake in the world, and it's over 12,000 feet. Um, but very few lakes uh, are of this size and this high in, uh, in the world. And it's one of the things that makes Lake Tahoe so unique and rare. Lake Tahoe, as I said, is a large lake uh, and it holds a lot of water. If we were to take a full Lake Tahoe and dump it out onto the state of California, which some people say that would be a good idea, particularly on a day like this, where it's 100 plus degrees throughout most of the state, you could cover the state with 14 inches of water. And now that we have an empty lake because we dumped it out on California, uh, and they've of course used it all up, how long do you think it would take to refill that lake, assuming no evaporation, that all the water that flowed in the lake just stayed there? It would take this many hundreds of years to fill the lake. Now I know in your questionnaire, it says 700. I think that might be a misprint. It's actually 600 years to refill the lake. So when you fill out the questionnaire again, you check off 700 because that's the closest number to 600. I think I in the past had used 700, but uh, Turk straightened me out on that. And uh, there's 39 or 40 million gallons of water in Lake Tahoe. I think the correct, I think it's 40 million now is the number that's, that's cited most often. 40 but, trillion. Uh, I think they're saying either 39, 40, 40 or 40 billion. Trillion. 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 I'm sorry. I was... I totally misspoke. Yeah, Million. and that is, uh, of course, that depends on that top six. Yeah. yeah. So um, again, let me correct myself. It's 40 trillion of gallons. The reservoir. And this is, uh, compares the volume of other large lakes in the world to Lake Tahoe. And as you can see, Baikal and the Great Lakes are huge in terms of the total volume of water, but they just don't have the depth that Lake Tahoe has. If Lake Tahoe had greater surface area and depth, then it would be a, a, a more comparably sized lake. But again, what sets Lake Tahoe apart is its elevation, high elevation and its size. So all this water, where does it go? Uh, there's 650 million acre feet of water that, that falls as rainfall and snow melt in Lake Tahoe each year. Um, about two thirds of it um, ends up, or I should say one third of it actually falls directly on the lake surface itself. And that's pretty important because that water does not have a chance to, to fall on the ground and become contaminated by picking up uh, soil particles and dissolving minerals. And what most people are unaware of is that two thirds of the water in Lake Tahoe actually leaves by evaporation. So that's one third roughly going through the dam and two thirds going in the air. I, I used to tell people that in, in days when the lake was a lot higher, if you look at the discharge going out of the dam and kind of multiply it, double it in your mind by two, that's the river that's going into the atmosphere from the evaporation off of Lake Tahoe. So you probably saw the Watermaster's article in which he said, oh, people are all worked up over releases out of the lake. It's pretty small compared to what's going on uh, up into the air. So Lake Tahoe loses about a 10th of an inch per day due to evaporation. And that's over, that of course works out to almost four feet a year of uh, evaporation off of Lake Tahoe, about five feet little over five feet of water equivalent flows into Lake Tahoe each year and about almost four feet evaporates away. Lake Tahoe does not freeze, even though this picture tends to show Lake Tahoe freezing, which it does. 
in, uh, in under certain conditions when the shoreline is very uh, near shore waters are very quiet and it's very cold, uh, you can get um, water that will uh, freeze and form ice on the top. Emerald Bay froze at least three times in the 20th century because it's it's shallow, uh, much more shallow compared to Lake Tahoe. Now what happens when a lake freezes is uh, you have water as it gets colder to 39 degrees. When water reaches 39 degrees, it's at maximum density. It's an unusual property of water. And once it reaches 39 degrees, then as it gets colder, it doesn't get more dense. It gets actually gets lighter. So it says I'm, I'm up, getting up to 39 degrees, it get, the molecule says I'm getting smaller, smaller, smaller. Once it gets above 39 degrees, it says, oh no, I'm getting bigger, bigger now. And so that's what happens. It goes from 39 to 32. And at 32, it forms ice, which we all know floats. What happens at Lake Tahoe is because of its volume and its area, our winters are just not cold enough to suck out enough heat to chill the water down to 39 degrees. So it, water is cooling down into that range of uh, 39 or 41 or 42 on the bottom. But what happens is while it hit, before it gets down to 39, spring arrives and the water begins to warm up again. So it never really gets cold enough from top to bottom 39 degrees where it can it forms ice. So depending on what you, you hear, Lake Tahoe is too deep to freeze. Well, we know Lake Baikal, which is over a mile deep, it freezes. Uh, if you read on the Forest Service website, Lake Tahoe doesn't freeze because the water is always in motion. Well, the waters of the Arctic Ocean are always in motion and violently slow. So, and it still freezes with ice. So it, it's not about waters in motion and it's not about depth alone. It's about the volume, the surface area, and the fact that our climate just doesn't get cold enough. If Lake Tahoe was in Siberia, next door to Lake Baikal, it would freeze. It would develop a layer of ice. Now, why is Lake Tahoe so clear? Well, there's a couple of reasons uh, for this. One is it's a very large lake in a very small watershed, relatively speaking, where one third is lake surface and two thirds is watershed. This is really unusual in nature. Uh, usually the watershed, the lake surface is about 5% and the watershed is 95%. So you have a lot of water coming into the, a small lake from a very large watershed. And once it has the chance to contact the, uh, the watershed, it picks up natural pollutants that cause the lake to lose clarity. Another reason is the extreme depth and the sealing of sediments and that removes natural pollutants. So if sediment particles get into the lake, there is a natural biological process in the lake that involved um, microscopic organisms that would consume the particles and excrete them as a pellet that would then sink to the bottom where uh, another biological process would actually seal off the bottom. And because the lake currents are not violent at the bottom, the lake does mix and turn over, but it's not enough to stir up the bottom. It, those sediments, once they get down there, they're forever locked in down there. And so the water above stays clear. There were other aspects to this too. Of course, the uh, stream environment zones that surrounded the lake, they helped remove some of the natural pollution um, in the lake. And, th and that has to be counted too. But the primary reason was a small watershed and the depth of the lake and the lake's natural process to cleanse itself. Now, we've all seen uh, this clarity graph, and this shows you what's been happening over uh, the last you know, 35, 40 years, uh, or more, I guess, it would be um, 55 or 60 years. Clarity has been measured with the Secchi disk, which you'll learn more about, which is basically a 10 inch white plate that's lowered into the water and they watch where the plate disappears, they measure that depth, then they pull it back up and measure the depth from where it reappears, average the two, and that's called the Secchi depth. And that's measured, uh, I believe, once a month 
around the lake. This is the every average. Every 10 days, actually. Oh, every 10 every days. 10 days, but they do have to throw out quite a few of the, uh, you know, if they get out there and it's too choppy yeah, right. or this, you know, if the yeah, sunlight's it. not great, quite right, if there's yeah. clouds, they, they won't use those. Yeah. So this is the average of the measurements that were used, annual average over the year. Uh, and as you can see, the lake is beginning, been getting less clear. In this case, unlike other graphs you look at, up is bad. Usually you look at a graph and the, the curve is going up and that's supposed to be good, like if it's your savings or whatever. But in this case, that's not. And as you can see, uh, the curve, uh, the loss of clarity occurred uh, quite rapidly in the um, middle to latter part of the 20th century. And then beginning in the uh, 2010s, it began to, began to level off. And I think we're keeping a close eye on this. I don't think anybody's ready to say we're out of danger yet, uh, but it looks like a lot of the improvements to the watershed, the healing of the watershed, uh, and the treatment of surface stormwater runoff into the lake, the removal of sewage from the watershed, have all contributed to the lake, the loss rate of clarity being slowed down, if not completely arrested. And I think we'll leave it to the Tahoe Environmental Research Center to tell us when they think uh, we've actually stabilized, but it looks like we've got some good news here that the lake clarity is at least beginning to stabilize, if not level off. These are uh, Secchi disk measurements from other lakes in the area. Uh, you can see Crater Lake up in Oregon, uh, very clear. Of course, it has almost no development around it and its watershed is probably only about 10% bigger than the lake itself. If you've ever been there, it's in a, a volcanic crater. Uh, but you can look at some of these other lakes like Lake Superior, Great Slave Lake, Lake Huron, Great Lakes. Um, they have clarity that's beginning to rival Lake Tahoe. This is current clarity of Lake Tahoe, which is about 65 feet uh, based on the most recent measurements. This is where it was in the late 60s in the 20th century. So you can see we've lost quite a bit of clarity. It actually um, is about somewhere around 40 feet of clarity has been lost up till now, even though it appears to be leveling off. Again, um, clarity is something that it's kind of like when you go to the doctor, they take your temperature and measure your blood pressure. It's like an overall indication of a lake's health. The clearer a lake is, the better the lake's health is. And, and clearer lakes are considered younger lakes, even though they may be old. Lake Tahoe turns out, in terms of years, to be one of the oldest lakes in the world at three to three and a half million years old, yet it's water would indicate that it's relatively young uh, in terms of uh, the amount of biological activity that is occurring in the lake uh, that would indicate that it's aging. We've all been to lakes that are pea soup green and cloudy. These lakes are um, age, aging biologically, even though they may still be relatively young age-wise in terms of years. Biologically, they're aging um, quite quickly. The process is called eutrophication. And uh, I think you'll probably hear more about it later in future presentations to get a little into a little more detail. Well, we've uh, come close to the end now of my presentation. And uh, this photo was actually taken from the place where Mark Twain first saw Lake Tahoe. And he, as I mentioned, uh, saw it in September of 1861 when he came upon us. And then 10 years later, I'll read to you what he wrote uh, as his memory of seeing this lake. We plodded on and at last the lake burst upon us. A noble sheet of blue water lifted 6,300 feet above the level of the sea and walled in by a rim of snow-clad mountain peaks that towered aloft a full 3,000 feet higher still. As it lay there with the shadows of the mountains brilliantly photographed upon its still surface, I thought it must surely be the fairest picture 
the whole earth affords. And that's where that term Ferris picture comes from, from Mark Twain. So I'll end it there. I don't know if we have any time for questions. I'll leave that to you, Heather. Yeah, we have time for questions. I'm going to go ahead and share the results with everybody. So um, of course, they were trick questions. So all the answers are correct. Um, <laughs> how big is it? It is, in fact, has that large of a surface area, the widest point, 12 and the 22 miles yeah. maximum, rounded, shoreline of 75.1, approximately 40 trillion gallons of water. So all of the above is correct. As far as the deep, how deep is the deepest point of the lake? Um, that, uh, again, all of those are correct. So everyone is correct in all of those. Um, so uh, the latest uh, measurement, it's, it, we expect our calculations indicate that it will fall below the natural rim in October if we don't get additional water inputs just based on evaporation. If you do the kind of just follow the standard graph of the summer um, evaporation right. rates. Um, which would then put it about 1.2 feet below, below the natural rim by the end of the year in December. Um, as far as if you were to drain Lake Tahoe, how many years would it take to refill? I guess 600 is the correct answer. Um, Allison helped us do these. And I think that our previous version of the yeah. thing had 700. So 700 or 600, 600 is correct. Um, according to the annual Tahoe water budget, um, so, uh, Again, these are all these are almost all correct, except that the uh, yes, these are all correct, I guess. So, but B and C are is the actual correct answer. That one third of all the exiting waters is released through the dam, and two thirds of the water leaves evaporation. So that's the water budget, and the um, outlet, the Lower Truckee River. That is also true, but that's not the only place the water goes. And then why doesn't Tahoe freeze? It's not that it's too big to freeze because Lake Baikal proves that point wrong. They even lay train tracks on top of Lake Baikal in the winter. Um, the correct answer is that it has a low surface area to volume ratio and the climate is so mild. We're a pretty Mediterranean climate that the water temperatures never get low enough for long enough. Um, the mixing and movement um, is, this, is what you'll read in a lot of the um, online sources. Um, but it's really that, that second answer, the, um, it's not cold enough for long enough. And then six was a trick question as well. Who was the great American writer? So Mark Twain is the correct answer. Um, his name was also Samuel Clemens. So A and C is the true correct answer as a trick question. But um, anyone who wrote A or C or D, which is all of you are correct. So um, and this was, uh, we are, it's two o'clock, so we are right on time, but we also can um, answer questions if anyone, I'm going to stop highlighting Dave so he doesn't have to be feeling so uh, um, highlighted there. <laughs> and if anyone has any questions, we can take those questions. Otherwise, our official um, agenda has us uh let's see with a short break and our an opportunity to do introductions where we can all meet each other and then at 250 i'll show you through our new tour booking system so if anyone wants to unmute themselves dave if you want to stop sharing your screen then we can uh, see each other and looks like i'm someone... sorry did this meeting start at one i had two o'clock on my calendar <laughs> sorry oh i did too i had two o'clock yeah uh oh well it started at one but we've recorded it <laughs> all right sounds good yes. yes sorry for that but i didn't know <laughs> does anyone have any questions for dave while we've got him yes mo i um i guess i just had a quick question and i hope i'm not asking a question that you actually already answered but um, the first dam that was over, um, you know, at the bottom, right at the top of the Truckee River, was it, did it hold more capacity in Lake Tahoe or what was the difference between the first dam versus the dam that's here now? Yeah, the, the first dam actually uh, had, was capable of holding more water than what's held now. Mm -hmm. uh, it actually set the record for high water at Lake Tahoe when it was just abandoned and no one was bothering to release water out of the lake and it just built up and overtopped the dam. 
but the current dam could raise the lake much higher than it does, uh, but it doesn't because of lawsuits from lakefront owners that did not want to have their property flooded and lost. And so as a result of litigation and negotiation over the years, the agreed upon high water of 6229.1 feet was what everybody has agreed to, uh, even though the dam that's there now is capable of raising it much higher. At one time, uh, they wanted to raise Lake Tahoe 20 feet higher than it is now, and also dredge out the lake outlet uh, another 10 or 20 feet to be able to drain more water out of Lake Tahoe. So um, all that was stopped by lakefront owners, thank goodness, and uh, prevented it from happening. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know if you can hear me. I can hear you fine. Okay, great. Um, I had read somewhere that uh, uh, during the Comstock period, where all the trees were removed, um, or so many of the trees were removed, that uh, uh, the trees that grew in later, especially the white fir and the Jeffreys, were different than the trees that were removed. And I was wondering what species of tree, if you know this. What's yeah, that's a good question. That's an excellent question. The, the forest that was here was um, a, what was called a late successional forest, meaning it was beginning to reach maturity. And so it had a broad number, a broader number of trees, types of trees. There were sugar pines, uh, there were ponderosas, there were lodgepoles, there were Jeffreys, and a few of the, of the white firs to name some of the major species that were here. The loggers went after, uh, and also the, the cedars. Uh, the loggers went after the sugar pine, the Jeffreys, and the ponderosa because that made for good structural lumber and they ignored the white firs that were there. Uh, they also ignored the cedars. That's why you see such large cedar trees around the Tahoe Basin and all the other trees are so small. Well, all the other trees got cut. And they left those cedars because they had no economic value. So what happened after all the cutting occurred is we went through a wet cycle and that gave the white firs a head start, which do well in the sun and under wet conditions. So they sprang up in dense amounts and crowded out the other types of trees. And that resulted in the kind of forest that we have now that's, as they, the terminology is overstocked. Uh, meaning the trees are too dense, growing too close together. They can't survive. We've suppressed the natural fire that would have thinned that all out. One important thing to think about, and I didn't realize this until recently in my research, is that the Tahoe old growth forest was actually organized into groves of about 10 acres each. And even though a fire would start in the Tahoe Basin by lightning, it would generally not go above 10 acres because it would burn in that grove and then couldn't go anywhere because of the distance it would have to jump to get to another grove. Plus the size of the trees, had they had adapted to fire and they could withstand a, a fast moving low brush fire and not, not die. They weren't small trees, they were large trees and they, they burned frequently. Thanks. Huh? Okay, there is a question in the chat, which was um, regarding the people not swimming, which I think is just so funny. Like, wouldn't someone just try to swim in the early 1900s? But it said, did they ever see any Washoe Native Americans swimming before the 19, you know, the early 1900s? Just it curious was, about the no floating theory. It and is, I know there's a story. It's probably part of the myth is that it was a tribal taboo to swim in the lake. Uh, because they understood that going out into the lake in the cold water was very dangerous. And so they had a, a very elaborate mythology about monsters and things like that that lived in the lake. And then if you went in the water, this monster, the Ongberg, might come and get you and take you away into its nest underneath the water. 
And so uh, as far as I know, the Washoe did not swim in the lake. They had no reason to. And it was part of the tribal rules that you don't swim in the lake because it was too dangerous. Perfect. Any other questions? Yeah. Well, you've been a great audience. I appreciate your attention. And yeah, well, I know that our break is running a little behind, but let's go ahead and take a 10 minute break. So it is 2.07 and we'll come back at 2.17. We'll have a chance for everyone to say hello and I'll just go around and choose names. And so if you wanna be thinking about this while you take your bathroom break or grab a drink or food, um, it's just your name, what you're most interested in about um, as far as uh, your interest in docenting and maybe a little bit something unique about yourself or where you live or where you're from. So it could just be your name and something about you. So we'll just each get a chance to introduce ourselves and I'll put that in the chat for everybody. So 217. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dave. Bye. Bye-bye. Great presentation. Thank